Welcome to the Bosch Cast with James Boschman and Denise Young, where we talk about Manitoba real estate and everything else that's on our minds. It's recording, and we're live. Hi. Denise. Yes. What has two butts and kills people? <laughs> what? An ass assin. <laughs> Uh, I love I love dad jokes. Um, thanks everybody for uh, tuning in to episode four of the Bosch Cast uh, with uh, James and Denise, myself and Denise, and uh, thanks for listening to our previous uh, podcasts or watching them. Um, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Um, it helps with our business and it helps get this um, information out to the masses. Um, and alternatively, if anybody has any questions, real estate related or otherwise, um, please send us them, um, you know, leave a comment under the video or you can message us directly and we'll answer them on the next podcast. Um, but yeah, this week, uh, let's talk about um, yesterday was the big day, January 25th, um, Bank of Canada, as predicted. 25 basis points. Um, so I guess in the grand scheme, um, it could have been a lot worse. Um, but old Tiff Magoo, Tiff Macklem, the governor, Bank of Canada, came out um, along with the uh, 25 basis point announcement. Um, also commented about how um, they're going to pause um, which is kind of redundant in a way because um, it's what they've been doing this entire time. You know, he's just announcing it now using the word pause, um, you know, and then he had a press conference after um, the announcement where reporters were asking him, um, you know, about, about his decision, about the Bank of Canada's decision, decision. and he was saying, their pause is conditional upon, you know, the the CPI coming down, the core inflation coming down to where they need it to be. And they've kind of forecasted a 3% target now. So I think in the last episode, I talked about my predictions as them, you know, moving that goalpost up from 2%, you know, there's no way they're going to get to 2% this year. And that is the, the, rhetoric that they're using now is they're changing from two percent to three percent um but he said it's conditional uh, what is it conditional on it's conditional on he's saying um you know inflation coming down but there are caveats to that because he said that if energy prices continue to rise that could have an impact that's out of the bank of canada's control and uh you know the reality is that ga gas prices just went up so they were at like 143.9 and today going around everywhere it's 155.9 right yeah so i know there's a lot of like closures happening like um oil refineries and stuff are closing um on the west coast and there's some shutdowns and then you know we've got the war and all that kind of stuff but you know um it's really uncertain as to what's going to happen if i was a if i was a betting man i would still say that um well there's kind of two things if tiff macklem didn't use the wording pause i think that we we might be in a little bit of a a better position because my thinking is when you come out and you tell the entire world the entire country that okay we're pausing that sends a signal that we are not going to raise rates anytime in the short term conditional right but that sends a huge signal to all the markets that okay well rate hikes are done now so let's go out and spend 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 mm -hmm. right yeah which is going to have the reverse effect i think it's going to 
cause inflation to stick around longer and be more stagnant. So I find it really weird that they had to use that wording pause. You know, you can, you can pause without telling people, I think it would have a much better effect. They call it, they call it jaw boning. It's when you, you use less words and you create a vagueness in the market so much so that people are unsure of what's going to happen. And the, un, the, the, the lack of confidence creates a fear in the market. That's like that itself stops excessive spending and it stops excessive buying and, and all this kind of stuff. Right. But when you use words that send signals, I don't know. It's just really, it's either again, an example of terrible monetary policy or there's something else at play. So, but, um, I still think we are in a climate where fixed rates can come down. And if we're all going back to normal, you know, like if our market is going back to this balanced market, because, you know, COVID isn't really impacting, we're not in a pandemic, you know, and they're trying to, the Bank of Canada and the government's trying to get us back to like the normal times pre-COVID. Right. Let's just think about it. 2019's real estate market was a relatively balanced market. So if we think about all that, then we're kind of back to the emotional normal market where December, January are quite slow. And then things pick up again, February, March, right? Yeah. So if we're back into this like spring market thinking, I think that depends on what happens with the bond market, but I think that banks have a little bit more play now to be more negotiable with the rates between lenders. And usually in a normal market, we see like that happen in the spring market yeah. because they want, they want, they want to stimulate mortgage applications. So my thinking is that by the spring could be as quick as, you know, February, maybe, maybe March. I think those rates are still coming down. I think the fixed rates are coming down, mm -hmm. um, which is going to stimulate, stimulate things again. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, the bank of Canada is basically saying, you know, we're pinching people and we're doing everything we can to make sure people feel pain. Um, but there are other things, I guess, that are out of their control, which, uh, you know, you can't really argue, but, you know, I think, I think there's going to be a, a, an impact of these, what, what was that number eight rate hike number eight, um, you know, we could, we could be bracing for impact for something here, but, um, but yeah. So if we're going back into balanced market territory, um, that means that more listings are likely to come online in the next month. Yeah. You know? And if there's more, um, competition, it means that, um, Realtors and sellers are going to be pulling out all the stops again to get houses sold. And that means agents have to work again, meaning open <laughs> houses, you know. And um, whereas in the last couple of years, we haven't really had to do, I mean, I shouldn't say we haven't had to do open houses, but. We always do them, but yeah, we we've seen a lot of realtors stop doing them. Stop doing them because, yeah. you know, you put a for sale sign up on uh monday and you have an offer date and what's the sense of having an open house because you know there's going to be hundreds of people through the open house and it's going to sell in in a bidding war anyway so yeah know, whether or not they had the open house they had they, i mean in the spring we had so many showings and you know with all the rules around letting people so only so many people in the house at a time and stuff yeah. it was a pain to do open houses covid regulations and everything oh yeah and now don't we don't have, have so many people that, in the so. house yeah so if we're going back to normal times 
you know, the pre-pandemic times, then I think, you know, we're going to start, I mean, we're already, we're already doing open houses like every weekend. And so, um, I am still like under the impression that buyers enter markets in waves and especially in our market where it's very seasonal. And so come February, there's, I know for a fact, there are a lot of people out there that are just starting the process and they're getting their pre-approvals, whether they're first time buyers or they're, you know, thinking about what their existing house can sell for so that they know what to, what to work with when they go to buy something and they're talking to the bank and they're doing Mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Cause the reality is a lot of refis are coming up too. So people are maybe thinking, well, maybe I should take advantage of selling my home now instead of refining and I'll go buy something else. Right. And it's kind of pushing them in that direction. So I think that, um, you know, a lot of buyers are kind of people in general, there's a stir. And I think buyers are entering the market or will be entering the market very shortly. And there's going to be a lot of buyers going to open houses again. Right. And so, um, I think it's kind of important to talk about, you know, open houses, um, the protocols that, you know, normally when we do, when we're listing a property, we have certain things that we like to talk about with our sellers about open houses. I personally, am a big proponent of open houses. Some sellers, they just can't do them or they're not comfortable doing them. And we kind of have to respect that decision. Um, they have their pros and cons mm-hmm. not just for sellers, but for buyers as well. And um, so, you know, as a, I'm just thinking first time home buyer, like, you know, they're probably like, you know, like a, like a little fish floundering in the water. You know, what do I do now? And yeah, let's go to an open house. Let's go check out some open houses. Let's <laughs> see what's out there, right? So, um, what are some things that buyers should know getting into the market, or if they're just like, even if they're not first time buyers, maybe they're, you know, maybe they have a house to sell and they just want to see what's out there. Right. What are some things that buyers should know um, when looking at going to open houses? And then alternatively, what are some things that sellers should know um, about open houses? Because the reality is, is that, you know, despite what other agents may say, they do work, but they have to be done properly. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it is important to set expectations ahead of time with both buyers and sellers. So, um, yeah, so what are some things that um, buyers should know? Well, I would say one of the important things that buyers should know is it's a great way to meet realtors. So if you don't have a realtor of your own yet, um, you get a chance to meet different ones and ask them questions and kind of get to know Mm -hmm. uh, the different ways that they might work uh, with you as a buyer and, um, and, and just like how comfortable you are talking to them because that's a really important aspect of who you should be hiring right like you need to be able to have honest conversations and it has um, to be a good fit the relationship has to be a good fit yeah exactly i also think like it's important to know that um at some open houses you're going to have to give your information and whether that's your realtor's name and number so that people can keep track of you know like the the realtor that's there has to protect themselves and the property yeah um so you know, many realtors will ask for information to mm-hmm. keep track of who's been in the house. That way, if something's missing, something's broken, something's spilt, <laughs> yeah. um, or any problems occur, there's a list of people who have been there. Yeah. I always tell my buyer clients, if I'm having a buyer consultation, especially with first time home buyers, mm-hmm. it's like, go to, go to open houses, check out, check everything out, see sure. what's out there, you know? Um, and then if you really like something, then call me and then we'll book a private showing and, and go and look at it in person. Um, but just know when you're going into open houses, you'll likely have to give out info and you'll likely be preyed upon because there are some, you know, vultures out there in the industry for sure. Yeah. They don't care that you have a realtor. <laughs> they don't care. 
No. So if you have a relationship with a realtor that you know, like, and trust, and you like to work with throughout the process of buying, make sure that you are forward with that. I know sometimes it can be kind of awkward, you know, but just tell them, you know, I'm working with so-and-so and um, then that agent knows to stop bugging you. I mean, they're still, yeah. Awesome. And they probably won't take the rest of your information at that point because they can right. call your realtor and say, Hey, your client came through my open exactly. house and now this is whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we get it all the time. I mean, spe specifically because we, do a lot of new home construction and right. we're seeing in show homes and open houses. A lot of times people, you know, the house is totally available. I mean, it's vacant. Nobody's living there yet. It's brand new. So buyers feel a little bit more, you know, um, confident to go and check out those houses. Right. Um, so sometimes, you know, we'll get calls, um, like we'll ask them, you know, uh, are you working with somebody? And sometimes people are, a little bit apprehensive um and sometimes people are like very straightforward and they'll be like yeah we're working with so-and-so and, -so. and mm -hmm. then what we do is we'll phone that realtor and say hey just wanted to give you a heads up you know your clients came through blah 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 you know just let me know if you have any questions or if you if your clients have any more information we can help them with um and uh but yeah so if you're a buyer um let if the house if the open house is hosted by a realtor which Chances are most of them are. I just let them know if you have a realtor to um, let them know that you have a realtor. Um, and the great thing about um, going to open houses, like I said, I think open houses are great to yeah. check out, is that it gives you an opportunity to see the house um, for an additional time, like for... Um, a lot of times my buyer clients will go to an open house first and then they'll call and they'll say, we really want to take a look at this place and then we'll book a showing and then we'll go in. But oftentimes it's the reverse where we're looking at a whole bunch of different properties in a day and things can get really confusing when you're looking at like five or six properties in a day. And so sometimes having an opportunity to go back to the open house with friends or family, people that you yeah. trust to give you, you know, good opinions or second opinions. Um, they'll have an opportunity to look at it as well, but then you have an opportunity to look at it for a second time. Right. And there is no real, I mean, there's kind of a deadline because these open houses are like typically two or three hours long. There's a window, but you don't have to feel pressured. Okay. We booked a showing for four 30, you have to be there for 4.30. The showing is 30 minutes long or an hour long, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, this way you can kind of go in um, and, you know, take a really good look, really hard look at everything, the area, the yard, the the basement, the you know, everything. Um, and you might get some additional nuggets or information that, you know, we weren't privy to because the reality is that when we book showings, sometimes we get, information but a lot of times we don't until we actually ask or call the listing agent so this might be a way for you to get it straight from the horse's mouth from the listing agent yeah um the downside to going to an open house as a buyer is sometimes there is a lot of traffic yeah. and it can create a sense of urgency which is great for the seller yeah <laughs> but it could be um a negative for a buyer who you know you don't know how many of those people there can actually qualify to buy the house or, or right. are, you know, are just being nosy neighbors or, or yeah. whatnot. But the, so like it can create a sense of urgency that may not actually be necessary. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And you know, sometimes um, when we're looking at houses, like outside of the open house, if we book showings, there are a lot of times, especially now that the COVID rules and regulations have really relaxed where, you know, chances are we might be in the property with another realtor. Right. Because, you know, showings are oftentimes double booked. And I know yeah. how uncomfortable that can be. Sometimes for buyers, it's like you got to be careful with what you really say or what you really feel about it. Um, you know, you kind of want to keep your cards close sometimes. Um, and it sometimes can feel that way too at an open house. So, mm -hmm. um, 
yeah, just don't be, don't feel pressure. Don't feel any of that. Just, you know, you're there to just like look at the property and get a feel for everything, get a feel for the area, um, get a feel for the things that if you were to purchase that property, you can't change later on. So without selling it. Um, so for sellers, um, I know, you know, oftentimes we have conversations with seller clients that are apprehensive about having open houses because they've heard, you know, you know, my friends, friends, whatever had stuff stolen or their cushions were moved or, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. You know, we, we always have protocols in place where we go through the, the list of things and how we do an open house when, when we're doing open houses to protect the seller, protect ourselves. Um, and then we make recommendations as to what the seller should do um, to make sure that, you know, those worst case scenario things don't happen to them. It's never, I don't think never happened in my career so far. I don't think it's happened in yours either where, no. you know, we're doing an open house and people come in and, you know, rob the place or whatever, but there have been instances, instances where you know and and stories in the industry from you know maybe agents who don't take the same precaution and um or maybe they do and stuff has just happened they, yeah yeah so but it's important to to um you know for us to set expectations with sellers mm -hmm. big things are the prep that they should do before and after um an open house um, make things, make sure things are accessible for people. You want to make sure that things are, it's easy for somebody to get into something like the um, furnace filter or the right electrical panel. Yeah. Don't make mm -hmm. it so that they have to like, you know, climb over your bed, climb over stuff <laughs> to get stuff. Right. Because people are people at an open house. Like, the reality is, is there's going to be a lot of tire kickers and there's going to be a lot of people from the area that are opinionated, but there's also going to be a lot of real serious buyers who are coming through mm -hmm. for that second look. To who bring also listen to the, the nosy neighbor who yeah. has an opinion. <laughs> right. And, you know, you want to make, they're going to be looking at your windows. They're going to be looking at, you know, the furnace. They're going to be looking at your electrical panel. They're going to be looking at the bones. Mm -hmm. Um and so just make sure things are accessible that way. Um, and then when it comes to valuables, like if you have items in your home, it could be monetary value or it could be sentimental value. If it's really, really important, put it in a safe or take it with you somewhere. Uh, yeah. Don't leave stuff out, you know, passports, uh, cash, change, um, you know, credit cards, jewelry, you know, everybody's got that junk. Grandma's jewelry. antique bays or her yeah. ashes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to leave grandma's ashes or, uh, or your dog's ashes or something out for people to accidentally, not, not that people necessarily no. steal it, but if they bump into it and smash it all over the place, well, now you exactly. got a dust storm, right? That's not something someone can replace. Yeah. So, um, if it's valuable, put it away, like do something mm -hmm. with it. Um, again, it's never happened to us, but, um, we, we try to take all the precautions that we can just to eliminate all liabilities. I'd say the worst thing that's happened to me during an open house is um, when Sensi became really popular. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know it still is, but now I'm really allergic to that stuff, so I can't use it. But I had bought a lot of Sensi from one of my clients and I was going to use them at open houses. Mm -hmm. And they are like a little pot yeah. And I bought the ones that plug into the wall like directly. They they were like a almost like a glade plug-in. Yeah. But they smelt better. And uh and they have like wax in the top. Oh yeah. Like that melts. And um in the base, I had plugged one in, in the basement. And um <laughs> when I went to close up, the one in the basement had been spilled. And I'm like, I don't know how oh. you can spill it, because like you literally have to unplug it to spill it. Yeah. Right? So 
it was like obviously someone who had attended the open house unplugged it and spilt it onto the carpet. Oh, geez. Right. So now I have an issue I have to deal with. Right. Yeah. We were able to get it all off the carpet. Uh, there's like a million YouTube videos on how to get this wax off the carpet. But yeah. Um, <laughs> the, but, you know, now there's an issue. So, yeah. you know, I never use them again. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that was the end of that. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we do we do our jobs as realtors as best as we can for to, sure to make sure that everything's going to be you know left the way it was um but we can't be in every room and right. you have multiple people coming in at a time so you can't just like yeah it would be great if we could follow everyone around but you can't yeah. our jobs are to showcase the features and benefits of that property that people may not necessarily see for themselves on the listing or in a showing like there's always those like je ne sais quoi things those little things that you can't really the articulate extra stuff, yeah. extra stuff. Yeah. those are the things that really sell that home so that's why i think and that's why an open house is beneficial that's why they're super beneficial yeah um but you know as a seller do the things prep the prep prep the house so that you're not dealing with the issues um, you're not dealing with thefts and stuff like that. And then when you get home, like after an open house is done, if there's a backyard, if there's gates, if there's a garage door, if there's an overhead door, you know, stuff like that, like we'll make sure to the best of our ability that that stuff is closed and locked and whatever. But when you come home, do the same thing. Don't just yeah. assume that everything is like tickety boo and back to back to the way it was. Um, because you know, there might be something that's missed like a window crank or like a window lock that's not locked. And then, cause people know. try the windows and might leave it open. Right. Or someone might open it thinking they might come back later. Yeah. Not that I've ever had it, but I've heard of it. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, just to touch on, um, sellers, I've had it before where I've gone into um, talk to somebody about selling their house and they've said, you know, we've been told through other realtors that open houses are a waste of time. It's just going to be the neighbors. Yeah. It's just going to be the neighbors. We hear it often. Now I would say that if you, if we're in the business of making sure that your home is sold, for the max price with the least amount of headaches, I think you need to make that house as accessible to the market as possible. You don't want to leave any stone unturned, you know? So do the open house because, and do it properly. Make sure that your realtor is doing it properly because if it's done intentionally with purpose, and, and that agent is proactive with it. I have had on multiple occasions where those nosy neighbors come out and I chat them up. And, you know, after the open house, I'm getting a phone call from that nosy neighbor's grandkid or nephew or whatever. And they're like, hey, my so-and-so came to check out the open house. Um, we're moving back from Calgary or we're moving back from wherever yeah we're relocating and we've always wanted to live close to grandma and grandpa or close to mom and dad yeah we love and that area can you tell us more about the property and they end up freaking buying it yeah so if you you know seem to have it in your mind that they're not good um it's all in how they're done and i would say that you know, don't, don't leave that off the table just because somebody said something because, you know, they are, they can be really beneficial. Um, it can be a great opportunity, like I said, for, for somebody's parents to come that maybe they're working out of town and they can't make it or somebody who is unrepresented who, mm -hmm. you know, maybe they haven't even gone to the bank yet to get exactly approved that's, so there's not a realtor that wants to show it to them right and that's where we can come in they can interview us they can talk to us we can set them up with our people who we know like and trust 
in the industry, mortgage brokers, professionals, yeah. get them pre-qualified, get them pre-approved yeah. and ultimately sell them the house. So, um, yeah, I would say if you have someone out there, don't want to bash other realtors, but if you have somebody that's telling you it's not a good idea, um, I would second guess that. Um, but yeah, so speaking of showings and all that kind of stuff, maybe let's get into your, uh, story this week. <laughs> My story this week. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> Story time. Oh my goodness, what's Saturday happening? PM to <laughs> AI. Um, I know. <laughs> it's come alive. My calendar has never done that before. <laughs> no worries. I'm like, whoa. Um, okay, so my uh, story has a lot to do with um, not just open, like what to do with your pets during open houses, but also like during showings. Mm -hmm. I find that, um, you know, when we're talking about um, what to do when you're moving, mm -hmm. um, uh, a lot of people talk about pets in regard to the actual move and, yeah. you know, like, you know, make sure that they're in their crate and safe while the movers are in and out and stuff like that. Right. But um, my story has a lot to do with uh, during showings because mm -hmm. um, it can be a really stressful time for pets. And we tend to always think about taking our dogs out, you know, drop them off at daycare or at grandma's house or whatever. But, um, but unfortunately we don't, we think our cats are super independent and aloof and don't care. Yeah. But, so this story kind of illustrates how much they can be stressed out. And, yeah. uh, you know, if we actually look at some of the other uh, stories besides this one, you know, cats tend to get sick during showings uh, because they are stressed out. Or, or I'm there petting them. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, they were saying that one of their cats were sick, and maybe that's why. Maybe because yeah, of all the showings, right? I don't, I know. Just, I don't know their situation, but yeah, again, I, I know I've had my own clients complain that after a few showings, their cat started getting sick, right? Yeah. And it's usually the stress of having people in their house, for sure. Yeah, and um, but yeah, so this one day I was showing houses and. It was during, um, I want to say it was like around like 2012 when the market was really crazy. And uh, there was lots of uh, tons of showings and lots of the bidding wars were happening at that time. And um, it was, um, I had, had gone to show a little house in uh, Transcona and it was uh, in a really good price range, super popular price range. So they had had probably I think there was like 40 cards already on the countertop and it had only been on the market for like two and a half days Wow! right so tons of people in this house so far yeah anyway so we come in and the cat comes and greets us right away and rubbing up against our legs and um you know I have a little bit of allergies so I tend to not pet them and whatever but I'll let them rub on me and uh the people I was with they're huge cat people so She's like petting him and massaging mm -hmm. him and everything. And, uh, you know, super nice cat. And anyway, so we go on to look at the house and going from room to room. And the cat's like kind of following us around. And, and um, you know, we go into the basement. And when we were in the basement, the cat actually didn't come all the way downstairs. He just sat on the top of the stairs and kind of watched us. Oh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and uh so as we were finishing up in the basement, I went to go up the stairs and I tend to go first. I, I, it's just how I kind of do things most of the time. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, the cat, I guess, felt very offended <laughs> and, and decided to jump on my face. Oh, my God. <laughs> and just was like, ah. Like lunged at you? And he got his tooth right through my lip. Oh, my God. I had a hole and scratches and everything, blood like crazy. And wow, my client had grabbed the cat and got the cat off me. And oh, um, I went upstairs to find some, like, paper towels and stuff like that. And, and I'm shaking because, like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the adrenaline just kind of makes you shaking and everything and um 
my clients were really upset and wanted to drive me home and everything. Um, but I wasn't that far from home. I was actually pretty close to home at that point in the day. And it was our last showing of the day. Oh, yeah. Um, so I had head, headed home. I was still bleeding and stuff. So my husband called like health links and, um, we found out that like with a cat bite, cause it was the tooth that had gone through my lip, the yeah. cat bite, you actually have to go to the hospital like immediately. Yeah. Cat's mouths are like the most, uh, like germ ridden things alive. Yeah. And honestly, I was like, Oh my God, we have to go to the hospital. This is going to take forever and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Right. Like our healthcare isn't great. So yeah. I go to the hospital. I think I just went to Concordia and it was the fastest I've ever been because as soon as you say I got bit by a cat, no they way. had you in the room. I had a tetanus shot within 10 minutes and I was out the door within 30. Holy crap. With a prescription for antibiotics. The downside, well, there was lots of downsides, but the downside for the cat is because now that I've talked to health links and the hospital, they're taking like the information of the where it happened and everything and now oh. this cat's being put into quarantine oh gosh right so like this cat's already super stressed out from having had 40 showings in his house and now he has to be put in quarantine oh man right so i'm just saying like it's sure it's a like we laugh about it nowadays like yeah that it happened, you know, my clients like to joke about, I slayed the tiger or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> but the, I didn't slay anybody. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, like the, you know, it was just such a stressful situation for that cat and had, you know, the owner, instead of um, leaving the cat there all day, had taken it somewhere else. Yes, that would be stressful too, but it probably wouldn't be as stressful yeah. as having so many people coming on his territory. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, um, you know, I, we're very good at like not leaving a dog there. <laughs> yeah. No, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say like, so many people, like, there. You know, there's cat people and dog people, right? Yeah. And um, but I feel like there are so many people that have cats that just should not have them, because they think that oh my cats are you know cats are obviously more independent than independent, a dog a dog's yeah. like having a child you know um and they i mean they are definitely more independent but they still like they still need care yeah they still need care and like can you imagine being that small and having random strangers like prancing around your house and like that would be terrifying and cats are way more territorial than dogs are. Yeah. So like that is their house. You're mm -hmm. just allowed to live there. Yeah. And like, I do find like when I talk to um, sellers that have moved, like clients that have moved, they've sold the house. Like I had, <laughs> I had one, this a little listing I had in St. Mattel. Um, <laughs> this cat was so territorial. We couldn't get it to stay wherever, like, because it was an outdoor cat, like, yeah, you know, nowadays cats are mostly kept indoors. But back then he, uh, she, that cat was left outside a lot. And she, mm -hmm. like, she was, she loved being outside. But the downside to that is they were staying on, um, in Niaqua Park. And my clients lived in Old St. Vitale when I had their house listed, right? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> that cat showed up at the open house. No way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, oh my god, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be over in Niagara Park, right? <laughs> and calling my clients, right? Your cat came anyway. When when they moved, they moved to a house on 206 yeah. in the country. And the new the new buyer called me. Their cat came home. <laughs> Like in San Mateo, yeah. Holy crap. Yeah, twice it happened actually. What? Yeah, they had to From, like, they had to force the cat to stay indoors for oh. like pretty much the rest of his life because he just kept going back to San Mateo. That's insane. Yeah. Well, I've definitely heard of that. Heard of yeah, stories. Yeah, cats of that are very too. territorial. That's their yeah. house and they want that. They don't yeah. want to move. So right. yeah, it's really difficult to make it so that your cat's comfortable yeah. and not like attacking people or puking all over your floor or whatever, yeah. right? So you do have to, you know, there's a lot of great places. I know, like, um, I know I talked about that company, uh, Perfect Paws that does my dog grooming. They also yeah. have cat's Gordon. cradle. Oh, so okay. 
it's like a really nice boarding with oh. cats, right? Like, oh, really? And it's a separate building uh, on the, a different side of their property than where all the dogs are. So it's not like the, wow. the cats aren't getting stressed out by yeah. listening to all the dog barking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, those are things that, like, I know a lot of people, they don't think about when they have cats. Yeah. But they definitely should to avoid situations like that. Yeah. Yeah, because now the cat, poor, the poor cat had to go into quarantine. Yeah. And I mean, that's not fun for ever, anybody. Like now no. I, like, I felt so bad about that, right? Yeah. Like, and I'm sure, I'm sure the seller didn't feel great about it either. That was yeah. his pet, right? I know. Like that's his, his cat. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and there's lots of instances where, you know, we'll book showings for our buyer clients. And oftentimes the listing agents will send us a message saying, just to let you know there's a cat on the property, please don't let it out. Yeah. And it's like, man, my job is to like show this property to my clients. I don't want to be wrangling cats. You know, I'll Especially pet them. Especially now that I'm scared of them. <laughs> yeah. Me, I'm, I love, like, I like meeting new cats. You know, I'm always meeting new ones. And it just reconfirms for me, like, how much better our cats are than yeah. our cats. But when uh, I'm in a house and there's a cat sitting on a ledge up high yeah. or... <laughs> the stairs I'm like <laughs> yeah yeah again it goes back to you know accessibility yeah make exactly. your house accessible to and not all. everybody is a cat person right right so some are definitely allergic and some of them are very allergic yeah exactly yeah, yeah. But. so yeah it does make a there is a lot of positives for, for taking the cat somewhere. And, you know, the, I've had some awesome clients that, you know, every time there's a showing, they go home and pick up the cat, just like you would, if you had a dog yeah. and take the cat for a little ride in the car. Mm -hmm. while someone's like, or yeah, if you're selling, mm -hmm. I've had many times where sellers, like if it's a younger couple or maybe, you know, the wife's parents live like grandma and grandpa live close by or something like yeah, that. Like, take the cat over there. Exactly. See if you can leave yeah. the cat with a friend or a family yeah. member or something. Yeah. Like that. Not be everybody way, can afford boarding. Yeah. Guaranteed be way less stressful on that animal than having, you know, people stomping around in the house and the cats, exactly. like, who the hell is this? You know? And oftentimes because they're, they're scared, they'll, that's, that's why they run out of the house. And then, yeah, you know, and then you got these, owners that come home and their cats have run away and that's not what we want either. So, yeah, but yeah. Um, but no, that's a, that's a crazy story. Holy shit. Um, yeah. so our topic of the week, mm -hmm. last week we talked about, um, the differences between market value, appraised value, tax assessed value. And I kind of mentioned, you know, at the end, the dangers of overpricing. Um, it's important to price it right, especially when we're in a market like we are right now, where it's kind of in flux, you know, um, you know, especially with interest rates and stuff like that, we're definitely moved into a more uh, balanced market, like I mentioned. Um, you know, again, don't want to bash agents, but when things are in flux, when, when markets change, you know, the reality is, um, real estate, our industry was absolutely ripping over the last couple of years. And a lot of agents entered the market. It created a lot of competition and created a lot of desperation, especially now that the market has shifted and, mm -hmm you know, desperation will make you do really silly things, including telling a seller exactly what they want to hear or overpricing a listing just to buy just the to, list. Just to get the signature on the paper. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, you and I, we know agents, I'm not going to name any names. We know agents that that's their whole business model is what do you want for your house? And then it's like, okay, sign here just because they're in the, the, the listing collection service and the more they, they deal in the law of, you know, averages. So, well, and they can pick up buyers and sell them other houses. Right. You know, <laughs> and it's, um, it's actually so 
terrible, not just for our industry, but for that seller, for that client, because you're not doing that person any favors, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And oftentimes these people, they'll go into like these realtors, they'll go into the listing appointment and they'll either say, they'll either ask, well, what do you want for it? Okay. That sounds good. Sign the contract or they'll, they'll just throw a number right there. I've had so many times where I've gone to a listing appointment and the sellers are like, well, so what do you think? And I will never, no matter how confident I am, the exact same property could sell next door, spitting image, same features and benefits. I might give them a range, but that range is going to be pretty wide. Yeah. And I'm going to say, don't hold me to it, you know, because. Yeah, because I haven't done my homework. It specific absolutely. It's so important to do your homework. There's so much more to price. Yeah. The market that. changes every day. Market changes every day. We deal, not only does it change in the macro as we've been talking about with all the interest rates and everything, but Winnipeg is a very hyper local, hypersensitive market. So you could pick up your house and move it across the street. And now it's value is either gone way up or gone way down. Right. Um, so, you know, it's so important that you, that you're not just like shooting from the hip with pricing. And so I feel like setting expectations is really important. Um, you know, um, but yeah, so I kind of want to talk about that a little bit, um, overpricing and, and the dangers and what can happen if you say, you know what, I'm going to go with the guy who told me exactly what I want to hear. Or I'm just going to, you know, just list it for what I want to list it for, sell it for what I want to sell it for, or else, you know, I'll find somebody who does. Because the reality is there's tons of realtors in Manitoba and somebody will take it, right? There's a sucker born every minute. Um, And yeah, so we can kind of go through that. I get all fired up when I talk about this kind of stuff because, (laughs) you know... It, it really irks me when we are um, getting calls to do market evaluations for people and we're trying to work in their best interest and we're competing for the listing against somebody who is not. And they're not because they're telling them that what exactly what they want to hear. Right. Um, Instead of what they need to hear. Yeah. So I would say what I always say is that we need to work together myself and the seller to come up with a strategy with a plan we got to figure out we got to look at the big picture we got to look at what's happening in the market at that current time Mm -hmm. um and that means like what else is for sale in your immediate area because that will tell us that if especially if we're in a balanced market what those buyers are also going to be looking at um and sometimes Um, I will often, if there, if there is inventory that's actively for sale, um, in the immediate area at the time that our listing is coming live on MLS, I'll book a showing, a preview showing. Um, I've even had it where I've shown other Mm -hmm. listings to my seller clients. Right. So that we can see in person, how does that house stack up, you know, because the reality is we don't want to be winning a price. We don't want to be competing on, on, you know, this price war. We want to try to, we want to try to prove value, um, to the customer, um, instead of like, you know, having buyers grind us down. Right. Um, so we have to look at everything that's active in the area, everything that's sold in the area to get a sense of what the demographic is that's going to be buying that listing. Yeah. I also like to show my clients what has, uh, expired in the area. Yeah. That's really important Mm -hmm. Uh, because it will, it, it, that is like proof that, you know, um, that, you know, yeah. Why isn't it selling? Is there something, it's either something wrong with the house or it's overpriced. Right. Um, there's the reality is there's a lot of psychology that goes into selling your home. You have to understand the buyer and you have to understand, you know, who's going to be buying that property. Um, When you list a property, if you take the, well, 
let's try my price approach or let's go higher approach and see what happens. The, the, one of the dangers with doing that is number one, you're not going to get showings and you're not going to get the feedback that you need from those showings to tell you about your property. Mm. And by the time that you um, finally realize it's too late and you've missed the mark, you want it. The, the purpose of pricing appropriately for the market is, you know, and timing and all that kind of stuff is you want to try to, um, you know, you want to try to get all of that initial interest in the beginning um, because, you know, you can't, you can't get that later on after you've done a price reduction. Overpricing a property will waste that interest and it will kill momentum um, and th that you're not going to be able to get back when it comes to finally doing a price reduction. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen it in the past where a listing, you know, days on market drags out the sellers really firm on price. They don't want to reduce price. They're not getting showings or they are getting showings, but the feedback is telling them that they should be reducing price, but they don't want to. The listing expires and then you relist it at a new price, maybe freshen it up a little bit with new pictures, new, new videos. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you start getting that action again, but that's, again, that's just proof of, you know, the pricing, pricing right to begin with is so important. Exactly. Um, because, you know, why, why go through all of that? Why waste 60 days on market? Why waste 90 days on market? You know, you're not doing anybody any favors. Um, so I like to think about pricing as, um, you know, when I go to the, when I go to the bakery department at my local Sobeys, the grocery store, mm -hmm. I'm always looking for bread or buns that are baked that day. And, you know, I, I avoid the, the stale bread, right? I avoid right. the, you avoid the, the buns that are, you know, everybody wants the stuff that's fresh. Yeah. And that's just the, the psychology and the mentality of a buyer. Um, if it's a day old, well, I mean, obviously listing uh, houses are different than bread, but if it's day old bread, why would you buy that when you can buy the fresh bread? Um, so oftentimes bakeries have to give the stuff away, right? Um, and they yeah, make other the value stuff. is lower. The value is lower. Um, you don't want people to think that there's something wrong with it. If you overprice it and you don't, you're not proactive with the pricing. Um, like our job is, you know, I'll be honest, like sometimes it is hard to price. For sure. And, and um, you know, sometimes maybe they're very unique. Yeah. If it's a very unique property, especially rural properties. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, you kind of have to like um, have a have a range and then and then some trial and error and then some trial and error. But it's so important to be proactive. Yeah, absolutely. Just... And that's partly why I always tell people you need to really be able to have those conversations with your realtor. And if your realtor is coming in there and telling you all the things you want to hear, are they going to be able to have that tough conversation if there needs to be a price adjustment? Yeah. Right. Like, not. And you need a realtor that's going to be able to say, you know what? I think I made a mistake. I think yeah. we should have, or the market has changed. Yeah. And right. Cause it's not always a mistake. Sometimes the market has shifted just mm -hmm. as you listed it. Yeah. Right. So the hard conversations are hard conversation are important. Mm -hmm. um, the other, the other thing, you know, um, with overpricing is that, you know, we work with a lot of buyers and I've been in situations where I'm showing a house to a buyer client and we know that it's been on market for 60 days. Mm -hmm. It's offers as received. I phone the listing agent. Hey, why is this thing still sitting? Uh, oh, well, you know, the right buyer hasn't come along yet. It's like, well, no, it's the price is wrong. Right. But the buyer buyers, they're very emotional. They don't want to offend people. So 
it's hard for me as a buyer's agent to try to bridge that gap to convince them, hey, they're open to an offer. Yeah, and they've made it explicitly company. clear that they're they're willing and receptive to look at all offers. So let's write something. Mm -hmm. you know? Number one, the buyer's going to think, well, am I wasting my time? You know, I don't really want to go through all this emotional stress if it means that I'm going to, you know, like if they're just going to say no, because then you have to have that conversation. Well, it's likely that we're going to get a counter offer. And then they're like, I don't know if I want to play that game, you know. I just want to go in with my price and, you know, feel confident. Had that seller priced it well, or to begin with, it had been sold. Or if they, if, if they had, um, you know, been proactive with, or the realtor proactive with having those hard conversations of, okay, everything else is selling around you and your house is only helping to sell other houses. We're overpriced. We need to do something to stimulate the the activity again um you know you're not doing not doing yourself any favors mm -hmm. um, and and you know buyers are you know they're but like a, a normal home buyer is going to be purchasing a property to live in they're not like a house flipper they're not like in the business of you know lowballing you know right they're not wholesalers these guys they're heartless they'll go out you know, throw shit at the wall to see if it sticks. If it doesn't, they're going to move on to the next one. A, a normal house buyer isn't like that. So you can't expect for them to just, oh, well, write me an offer if you like it. Yeah. You know, if you had it priced more appropriately, maybe they would write you that offer. Um, and the reality is there's always another house that is going to be priced more appropriately. There's always other fish in the sea. So why would that buyer, you know, waste time and emotions um, negotiating when, you know, another property is right around the corner? Um, so those are just some examples of, you know, why it's dangerous to overprice your property. And, you know, our job as listing agents is to work together with you to come up with a strategy, to come up with a plan based on the full macro picture. Um, you know, and every property is so different and, you um, you know, you can't just paint them all with the same brush. Um, the one thing that I like to say is when it comes to pricing, we need to work together as a team, That's the right. seller and us. And it's not, you know, me versus you on price. It's us versus the market. And we need to be diligent, um, you know, especially when we're going into a more balanced market now. Last couple exactly. of years, you know, you throw the duct tape for sale sign outside you have an offer date next monday you get 10 offers you know easy um but you know that's just not the way it is anymore no um but yeah do you have anything to add to that no i think we hit most of it awesome mm -hmm. cool okay so we'll finish this thing off and we'll um we will uh give some flowers to some local businesses that we love um, just like we do every week. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you take it, you take it from here. You okay. Go. Well, I'm going to shout out to Wolf and Wags this week. They are a doggy daycare. They also do grooming and uh, they probably do other stuff, but those are the two things I've used there. Um, they have like a Sunday fun day for small dogs on Sundays, obviously, which my girls love because it's just the afternoon. So then they're, pooped but they're not extremely tired like mm -hmm. yesterday they were there for the full day and they uh pretty much slept all night last night and all day today nice. you know it just poops them right out but they have lots of fun and uh I find they call them the aunties and uncles all the people that work there and they give them lots of cuddles and love and it's nice. so just a great place to send them and they have like the different areas for different sized dogs yeah yeah that's really important yeah, we really love it. So we know that our little dogs are only going to be playing with other little dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then my other one is a new business, actually. Oh. They opened up, uh, I think, right before Christmas. Uh, they're called Georgina Sweets and Boutique. And they're at 1783 Plessy. And um, they ha are sister owned. And uh, it's all like local products. Oh, cool. And uh, so I needed a gift for someone yesterday. And, uh, 
you know, it just kind of popped in my head that maybe I should go check them out. <laughs> and uh, so I went to, uh, to check them out and they have so much cute stuff in there. It was like hard to decide. And I'm like totally addicted to buying toques right now. And they had so many beautifully like knitted toques cool. and even ones for babies. They were so cute. <laughs> Are they the, uh, did they make all the stuff or is it just local? It's all local makers. Oh yeah. Yeah, and then they do, um, like, the sweets, I believe, are from themselves. Oh, cool. Yeah, so they have, like, a counter with some, I think, yesterday it was mostly cookies. Oh, yeah. um, uh, maybe a bar. I don't remember exactly. Yeah. Um, but I had gotten this. Um, oh, neat. Yeah, and then That's I'm cool. just going to put a frame on it. That's cool. And yeah, uh, that stuff is great for client gifts, too. Right, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and that this company was, is a local company like who had, uh, this local maker is Prairie Home Lettering. And, uh, they had all kinds of cute Valentine's Day cards in there. And, um, there was just so much different stuff. They had like, uh, you know, Stone City Coffee and, oh, wow. um, I can't even remember all the stuff. So beautiful macrame. Um, oh. yeah, just it, a really nice gift shop. I really, I really liked it. So I could see myself going there again <laughs> and uh, to pick up gifts, you know, when I need something yeah. and lots of baby stuff. Like if I, I'm like mental note, if I need a baby gift, I think that would be a good place to, to that's pick cool. some stuff up. They had quite a few different things. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll have to check it out. Mm -hmm. pick up some client gifts. Um, so mine this week, I've got a restaurant, um, Deer and Almond. They're at 85 Princess. Uh, it's uh, my boy, Mandel Hitzer. He's the head chef and owner of the restaurant. He's also the guy who um, kind of spearheads the raw almond at the Forks. Mm -hmm. um, he's pretty consistent doing it before COVID. And, um, you know, obviously couldn't do it through COVID, but it's back up and running now. Uh, tickets sold out like day one um we stood in line i think it was yeah. like five or six in the morning at the forks um we were able to get tickets but basically what it is it's he is a like a world-renowned um chef great guy um he's got a great restaurant um but he 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 um has built relationships with michelin star chefs michelin star restaurants uh across canada and in, in the u.s as well and really all over the world and um raw almond at the forks he brings um these chefs out to um co-host uh events every night there's like a different chef and they have a different course different pairings um mm -hmm. it's like a full course kind of meal and experience and then yeah. he partners with an architecture firm to design and build this amazing building outside and right like uh, the whole experience is just so cool mm -hmm. um and uh yeah so but deer and almond um yeah i don't know if anybody out there is looking for a did, great, it, date did i see something about them uh because they were sold out i think i saw something about them doing like a little lunch offering every day yeah so that's just all walk up yeah, they're doing that. And then they're also doing, um, they, I just read today, they have like a, an event where they have DJs and all this oh. kind of stuff. Um, they're going to be having like champagne and everything. So wow. um, yeah, they've kind of made it, I guess for people who couldn't get tickets, yeah. made it more accessible for those people. But right. Um, okay. But yeah, no, it's just, Mandel is such a great human being, such a good chef. And mm -hmm. You know, if anybody out there is looking for a great date night, if you haven't been to Deer and Almond, you have to go. It's 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 just such a fun restaurant. He's got like tons of neon in there. It's really bright, lots of colors. Their cocktail menu is insane. It's so good. Yeah. And that restaurant has created so many talented uh, bartenders and chefs, including Emily Butcher, who is the head chef and owner of Nola Restaurant in St. Oh, Boniface. Cool which is also another amazing, amazing restaurant. And she's going to be doing um, like a vegetarian uh, type night at Raw Almond. Um, oh, cool. Uh, so she's going to be cooking as one of the chefs there as well. So, yeah. but um, 
but yeah. And my second business uh, business of the week is uh, Frank Motors. I know I've shouted them, shouted them out before in yeah. other other ways, but uh, I just I love love that taking our vehicles there. Their their service is so good, um, and they specialize in European cars and imports. Um, so Tara's got a Mercedes. I have a Honda, and um, yeah, they, every time I go there, they always offer. Um, to give you a ride so they don't have a courtesy car but they have a driver who will if you don't have somebody to pick you up Mm -hmm. servicing your vehicle and you bring it there say in the morning uh you can get in with this guy and he'll drive you to work and then they'll Mm -hmm. pick you up when your car's done so um i just find their their rates are really reasonable they've always been super honest they've always done such a great job in our cars and uh yeah just from a service point of view they're they're top notch so yeah highly highly recommend i know from working in the automotive industry myself they've always had a really good reputation yeah and um they're at 575 notre dame so kind of like close to you know health sciences center um Mm -hmm. that area so but um yeah that's it for me for this week awesome So yeah, thanks everybody again for checking out another episode. And uh, again, please feel free to like, share, subscribe, and uh, look forward to seeing you guys uh, next week. Sounds good. Bye. Have a great one.